Chapter 4, A Celebration, An Insect Symphony, and a Troublesome Feeling. It's now been eight months since we last saw Pitch. I think before we declare victory, it would be best to consult with the man in the moon, Albrecht said. And that means a journey to the Lunar Lamadary, Manimand and North said together. The Lamadary sat on the highest peak of one of the highest Himalayan mountains, and it was where it was there where North had first met both the Lunar Lamas and the man in the moon. North was ready to leave that minute. It was a great chance to meet again with the Yeti warriors who defended the city. They had been quite helpful when North had been learning the secrets of the magic sword the man in the moon had bestowed upon him. The sword was a relic from the Golden Age, and there were five of these relics in total. Bunnyman had one as well, the egg-shaped tip to his staff. The man in the moon had said that if all five were gathered together, they would create a force powerful enough to defeat Pitch forever. But peace seemed to be at hand. With any luck, the guardians would have no need for more relics. But North had been wondering how he could keep, how he would keep his warrior skills sharp, or if he even should. With the Yetis, he'd again have been have able competitors with whom to practice his swordsmanship. Umbrick turned to Bunnymund. He didn't even have to ask about making a tunnel, because next to making chocolate eggs, digging tunnels was the Pooka's favorite pastime. One tunnel coming up, Bunnymund said. It'll be ready in 27 half yokes. That's one day in your time, human time. Outstanding, Omrick said with a nod. We'll take the whole village. Everyone is welcome, he added. It'll be a grand adventure. We'll plan a celebration tomorrow evening to see us off. Catherine clapped her hands together in excitement. Kalish will be so happy to see the other great snow geese, she thought. She'd wondered if her goose ever missed the flock of massive birds that nested in the Lunar Lama's mountain peak. But her excitement was tempered by her unease about nightlight. She glanced at him, but he would not return her gaze. Instead, with his amazing speed, he shot out the window and into the clear blue sky. But he did not seem bright, Catherine noted, and her unease grew. The next day found Santoff Plaza full of preparations for the trip and for a celebratory dinner. The egg bots whipped up frothy confections, and the ants, centipedes, and beetles tidied big root while glowworms while glow glow set up tables in the clearing tables that would be heaped with delicious foods. Not to be left out, squirrels made teetering piles of nuts, birds filled their feeders with seed, and mouth-watering smells came from every nook and cranny of the village. That evening, the children led a parade of humans, of humans, elvish men, insects, birds, their great bear, the genie, Norse wonder horse, Petrov, and one very tall puka to a well-decorated clearing. The moon was so luminous that the villagers were sure they would, could see the man in the moon himself smiling down at them. The litter moths glowed, and Ombrick's many owls hooted softly. Soon the children were jumping onto the backs of the village reindeer and racing them across the evening sky while Catherine and Kalish flew alongside. Fireflies circled their heads, making halos of green-tinted light. Down below, Norse elves ate plate after plate of jam, roly-poly, noodle pudding and sweet potato schnitzels topped off the, topping off the meal with elderberry pie and Bunneman's newest chocolates. A delectable blend of Aztec cacao and purple plum, all the while asking North to describe the meals prepared by the Yetis, accomplished chefs all, at the Lunar Lumbadary. It seemed that being turned to stone and back again was a hungry business. Even the crickets came out into the, the moonlight to play a sort of insect symphony to the delight of everyone. Finally, when all the games had been played, the food eaten and the song sung, the village of Santoff Clausen settled down to sleep. Up in her treehouse, however, Catherine lay awake. Nightlight had been the only one who had not joined the party that night, and it bothered her. As did something else. Ever since the last battle, Catherine found that in quiet moments like this, her mind often drifted back to Pitch and his daughter, the little girl he had fathered and loved before he'd been consumed by evil. In the final moments of their battle, Catherine had shown Puka a locket, or shown Pitch a locket, a locket that held his daughter's picture. She could not stop thinking about the anguished look on Pitch's face or her own longing to be loved as deeply as Pitch's daughter had been loved by her father. Does that feeling only happen between parent and child, a father and a daughter, Catherine wondered. She had lost her own parents when she was just a baby. It was true that here in Santa Claus, many people loved her and cared for her. Ombrick and North were like a father and a brother to her, but that wasn't the same as a real family, was it? She couldn't help wondering whether anyone would feel that, some, that same anguish she'd seen in Pitch's eyes if she were lost to them. And there was nightlight. She sensed his current melancholy. 
He'd, he'd, he's never had a parent, she thought, and he had seemed happy enough. But now something was wrong. She would find out what it was. She would make him happy once more, and then maybe she'd be happy too. That thought brought comfort to the gray-eyed girl, and soon, like everyone else in the village, she was asleep. But a strange wind blew through Santa Clausen. It caused the limbs of Catherine's treehouse to gently sway. If Catherine had been awake, she'd have felt uneasy, as though she'd be, was, as she were being watched by a force nearly as ancient as, pitches, as pitch, whose motives and deeds would change everything. If Catherine just opened her eyes, she'd have seen what was in store.